Oh, man, is right. Has this music not been incredible? <laughs> Bringing the story to life through music is one of the greatest gifts for me and for our church and for Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you guys have done. Once upon a time, once upon a time, I wanted my bike to go faster. Once upon a time, we had a young middle school boy come and live with our family. Once upon a time, there was a young woman in my office that was wrestling with who she would be, what God was calling her to. Once upon a time, my marriage was on the rocks. It looked like it was about to end and a pastor sat down with me. We all have stories to tell, stories that we can fill in the blank on, stories that open with once upon a time. And I think a lot of times when we look at the Easter story, we look and it's sometimes embraced in a way that's a fairy tale. It's a once upon a time. But the reality is that it's once upon a time story from people that were there that are passed down to us as stories for us who are here. And we're meant to embrace these stories and to realize that they walked this journey. They walked this journey and their stories are as real as my story about wanting to go faster on my bike, as real as that young middle schooler coming to live with my family, as real as that young woman that was wrestling with what she would be, as real as the struggle in my marriage. The stories of Jesus Christ, the stories of the disciples passed down to us over millennia are just as real. Amen? And so you walk through the story and you think of the, the stories that we celebrated. If you were here for a Maundy Thursday service and the choir was here and the orchestra was here and the handbells were here and we celebrated communion together and the reason that we celebrated that on Maundy Thursday, it's not Monday Thursday, so you're not confused. Maundy means mandate. It means law. And what we're celebrating when we sit down in those moments is we're celebrating Jesus as the story goes, as the once upon a time story goes, taking off his robe. And as he takes off his robe, he grows over and he grabs a towel and he gets some water and suddenly he's going from disciple to disciple to disciple. And you can picture each one of them looking in his eyes and him looking into their eyes and they remember the moment and it becomes their story of him washing their feet and trying to teach them what it means to be a person that is, that is a master. And what does it mean for a master to actually get on the master's knees and wash the servant's feet? and to give them the mandate, the new rule, the new law, Mondi. And the new law is love one another. And if you went into all the other gospels, you know that there's this command in there, the greatest two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor how? As yourself. That's not what he says in John's gospel. What he says when he gives this mandate is love one another as I have loved you, right? As I have loved you. Because quite frankly, I think Jesus is sitting there looking at them and saying, the way that you love yourselves ain't nothing compared to the way that I love you. Because if we're honest, there's times in our life where we don't love ourselves. We look at our lives and think we could have done something better. We could have said something better. We could have done something better and we feel like we mess up and then we, we look down on ourselves. And so how are we supposed to take that love that we're supposed to have for our, ourselves and give it to others? John's gospel is saying, you do it by loving the way that Jesus loved you. That's Thursday, Friday, good Friday. Good Friday is the time when, when Peter, 
or in the early morning hours, goes and has this moment where he denies Jesus not once, not twice, but three times, and he hears the cock crow, and suddenly he realizes what he's done. Good Friday is the, the time when the disciples all scatter and flee and run away. Good Friday is the time when he goes before Pilate and he's tried. Good Friday is the time when he goes before the crowd and they give the option of Barabbas or Jesus, Barabbas or Jesus, and they just keep saying Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. Set him free, crucify him. Once upon a time, he had to walk through the street and he's carrying the cross on his shoulder. And as he's going, because he's been flogged by the Roman army, he can't carry the cross. He can't carry the burden of the physical cross that's on his shoulder. And suddenly, one of those centurions walks over and says, you, you, come here. And this man comes forward. And someone thought enough to find out his name. Simon of Cyrene. And now he's in this story and he carries the cross. Once upon a time, they heard the nails. They heard the scream. As they went into wrist, flesh, ankles, and they hoisted the cross up and Jesus was on the cross. Saturday, silence. Almost nothing happens. Almost if, if to say, end of story, game over, nothing left to see. It's the day where you're caught between Good Friday and Easter, between darkness and light, between chaos and hope. And there's nothing but silence. And the disciples don't know what's going to happen. And you can picture them gathering together going, what happened? What do we do now? What next? Then, Sunday. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They'd been saying to one another, who's going to roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And as they entered the tomb, they saw this young man. He's dressed in a white robe, sitting off to the right side. Clearly, they were alarmed, not expecting to see this person. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised and he's not here. Look, there's the place where they laid him. But go, go and tell his disciples, go and tell Peter that he's going ahead of you, going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him. And just as he told you, so they went out and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. That, my friends, is the end of the gospel of Mark. It ends with the story not finished. It ends with us having to wrestle and say, why? Why would it stop right there? Scholars look at that passage and they're like, clearly what happened was a page got torn out. There's meant to be more story. There's meant to be a thing that concludes it, that wraps it up, that brings us to life and it gives us a place. And you might be sitting there saying, Richard, we know the rest of the story. It's why we're here. It's why we're here on Easter. But do you really know, do you really know why you're here? Not just on Easter Sunday, why are you here? And when I get to Mark's gospel, this, I love this ending where it just, it leaves this unfinished piece to it. And the fact that scholars, some of them are uncomfortable with it, they're not alone. If you have a Bible, 
if you have an, a, especially a study Bible, yours might say what my study Bible says, all right? That's the first ending. Verse eight, then it says the shorter ending of Mark and it goes on for another verse. And then it has a longer ending, it says, of Mark. You wanna know why that's there? It's there because even back then people were like, how can it just stop? How can the story stop right there? How could it just end with, with the women of all the people, okay, of all the people? You got Peter, who's the denier, has fallen away. You've got the disciples who've fallen away. The one group of people that's left are the women that have been there. And suddenly Mark's gospel concludes with, they failed. Everybody has failed. So, some other people look at the same text of Scripture, look at the same book of Mark that these other people are looking at and saying, no, I think it's supposed to end right there at verse 8. Right there at verse 8, it's supposed to stop. And one of the thoughts is that when it stops right there, when it stops and stops with the women running away and nothing gets shared, that what would happen is they'd be reading the whole books. So they'd be sitting in church like this, smaller groups, house churches, and they'd pull this gospel of Mark out and they would read this story, this story of stories, this story of stories of people that were there experiencing every one of the stories that you see in here. And as they would get down to the end and they get to this verse and it came to the place where they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid, right then, the person who was reading the gospel would step aside and up would come a person that had been there, a person that was there. And if you step into like Paul's story, you step into Corinthians, you hear the testimony, you hear the testimony of, of him appearing to Peter and to the disciples. You hear of him appearing to 500. You hear of him appearing to James and the apostles. And last of all, to me, Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, and that the word spreads through them. So maybe one of them, one of those 500 and some odd people was one of the ones that would stand up right at the end of the reading and say, once upon a time, this wasn't the end of the story. And that once upon a time is now. He lives and he lives now. So maybe it's that way, or maybe one more possibility. Maybe Mark intended for that book to stop at verse eight on purpose, or maybe by God's divine providence, somehow God decided, you know what? We're gonna get that little page torn right out and it's gonna stop right there with those women failing. Why? So that we, can finish the story. So that every person that's ever come to the end of Mark's gospel gets to the place where they have to go, it stops, fill in the blank and you fill in the blank with your life. You fill in the blank with your words, your actions, the way that you treat other people. You are the person that brings the story alive. Do you know why you're here? You're here to bring the story alive. You're here because you have a story to tell. Ask me how I know. Go ahead. Richard, how do you know? Because Jesus and I are like this. Right? Just like this. And maybe because also, if I turn over to John's gospel, we find out Jesus told us what was going to happen. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will do what? Even greater works than I do. And in fact, will do these because I'm going to be with my father. I'm going away. And you're going to be the one. You're going to be the one who finishes my story. And I wonder if there's not a possibility of Mark sort of getting that, having heard that somewhere along the lines through his story before he wrote this book or hearing it from somebody else, that Jesus spoke those words and he stops his gospel and says, I'm going to leave that blank right there, right there. And that now everybody, 
everybody, you, me, you, you, way in the back, you, way in the back up against the glass wall. Every one of us has this. Every one of us is this close to Jesus. And therefore, every single one of us can now live the story and bring it to life. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Mark's blank ending, fill in the blank ending, leaves us yearning and questioning, what about Monday, your Monday? You are Monday. Back in the day, it was James and and John. It was Peter and Thomas. It was Mary and Mary that we just heard about and Salome, right? It was those people. If I was to say this scripture today, I'd say Nicole, right? I'd say Sally. I'd say Jeremy. I'd say Will and Jenny. I'd say Lee. I'd say your names because you're now the people that are the story. You're the ones that are supposed to be living out the story now. I'm supposed to be living out the story. And the reality is we weren't supposed to just do it individually. We're supposed to do it together. Why are you here? It's not just because it's Easter Sunday. It's because there's a whole life that comes after this moment that we get to live. We, plural, we get to live together. Jesus didn't go to that cross for just any reason. He didn't go just to forgive your sins. He came and gave his life that you can live a life that is new, a new life. That's the story of scripture that is before us. So what's your story? Once upon a time, I wanted my bike to go faster. And I was in middle school and I was studying science and we were learning about friction. And I thought, I'm looking at my front wheel and wondering if I just loosen that little bolt. (laughs) Why are you laughing? (laughs) If I just loosen the bolt just a little bit, there's going to be less friction. That's what was in my head. So I got my dad's little toolbox. I got it out and I unscrewed just a little bit. And I hopped on my bike and I rode a very short distance (laughs) because I hit a bump. And when I hit the bump, the forks popped out and the wheel went this way and the forks went that way and I went that way. Part of our story is that sometimes we're idiots, <laughs> right? You can laugh, but that's real. We do things that aren't smart. Once upon a time, there was this young man in middle school that came to live with my family. His mom was in and out of the hospital all the time, going through procedure after procedure after procedure. And they reached out to Lynn and I, and they said, will you take our son into your home for a while? We have to keep making trips to the hospital. We have to keep going to hospitals out of our area. It's chaos for him, and we need some stability in the midst of the chaos. And so Linda and Richard and Brianna and Nathan took in a young middle school boy. That middle school boy is now 21 years old. And every time we do contemporary worship, one of the key reasons that contemporary worship happens every single Sunday is because that little boy is now the tech director for our contemporary worship service. His name is Gideon. And his family trusted us enough to place him in our care. Once upon a time, this young lady would come into my office and we'd sit down and we'd talk and we'd talk about her life and her calling. And if you saw her, it's like every time you see this girl, it's like, 
if a person that was following Jesus was to look like a person, it would be that. Genuine, authentic, passionate, all wrapped into one beautiful package. And we would talk about different things and different things that she could do. And she's like, maybe it's kids, maybe it's kids. I'm gonna, what if I work with kids? And she got connected, this group that took her around different countries in the world, teaching kids how to hula hoop. I kid you not, all right, how to hula hoop. It was called Hula for Happiness. And it was put out through a different church. And she connected with this other church. And the cool thing was, we didn't care. We didn't care there was another church. She was trying to find out who she was going to be. She came back after a few months and said, that's not it. <laughs> right? So she started working with youth. And I got to watch her work with youth. And then I got to watch her this morning do an offering prayer. Her name's Casey. Maybe you've heard her preach. Maybe you've seen the authenticity, the passion, the heart that is in that young woman. Once upon a time, my marriage was nearly at an end. It's before I, before I became a minister. Lynn and I had come to the church. We'd been here a while. And we hit a rough spot. And I remember I was talking to somebody after one of the services this morning. I remember, I'm a child of divorce. Parents were divorced. And I remember saying, at least in my head, that ain't never going to happen. There's no way that's going to happen to me. Not only will it not happen to me, I'm not going to do it. And yet I found this moment where we were just like, oh, just in danger of that, just on the precipice. But I was going to church at this little place called Anona, and I had this pastor named Jack. And I came to sit down with my wife and with Pastor Jack. Still married. Same woman. <laughs> Once upon a time is the story of our lives. It's the story of the Bible. And once upon a time, I'm hoping that you're able to look back on your story and say, once upon a time. And you can think of the moments where where you unscrew the bolt to the forks on your bicycle. And you can claim the places where you were an idiot <laughs> and you messed up. I hope you can look back and see stories like Gideon and Casey. You can see moments maybe where you've wrestled with things, whether that is your marriage, whether that is loss of somebody that you love deeply, whether it's a, an illness that's going on through your family. And to realize Easter is about so much more than Sunday that is Easter. Easter is about a life that you live together. One of the key ways that I got through that moment with Linda was the fact that I was a part of the church. I didn't have to come learn somebody's name. I knew Jack, Jack knew me. Jesus Christ put the church here that happens to be called a Nona. But it is the church of Jesus Christ. The resurrection, guys, is an invitation. It's an invitation for you to be a part of something that's bigger than you, bigger than B, bigger than a Nona, because it's Jesus' church. And I love how Mark's gospel ends. I love that it finishes with go and tell. Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell Peter. He ain't here. He's risen. He's coming to you. The last people I'm thinking in the world that want to see the risen Jesus Christ 
is his disciples who ran away and fled, and Peter, who is called out by name at the end of Mark's gospel by that little guy sitting in there that alarmed the women because he had denied him three times. And they're probably thinking, even if his story is continuing, my story, our story is over. Instead, new life. Let's pray. God, we love the story. And God, I hope that there's an ability for each one of us to be able to say once upon a time, once upon a time in my life, I messed up. There might be a lot of those stories if anybody's here like me. But that there would also be once upon a time stories where you take somebody in you're trusted by another. You walk with somebody else who's struggling. Or maybe, God, we're going through a struggle and we're able to realize that once upon a time we turned to somebody and they were there for us. What we realize, God, is that the story is not over. There's so much yet to come. And what you've given the gift of this church to do and to be is to have groups like Stephen Ministers that walk with people through difficulty. Caregiver support groups, grief groups, as people struggle with loss and new diagnoses and spouses and family members that are going through horrible things. You also give us the ability to be able to celebrate 150 years of ministry at a little church on a side road in a dinky little town called Largo. A church that sends people out to read to kids at Ridgecrest Elementary. A church that feeds kids at that same school that they might have food on their tables on the weekends. A church that steps into multiple schools in order to connect with families, to do all pro dads and I moms, to say if you ever need a church, if you ever need support, we're here. Story after story, prayer quilters, I can just keep going on, God. And I give thanks that we're part of a church that has so many opportunities and ways for us to share your love with one another for that is what you call us to do. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, they will know that you are my disciples. We thank you for the one who spoke those words and we pray it in his name, Jesus the Christ. And we all say, amen. amen. Easter, my friends, opened a door. The question is, will you step through to new life? Pray you will. I pray you'll have once upon a time stories that bring smiles to your face, brings laughter to your family, brings joy to your heart, gets you through the tough times, and gets you to the place where that song that you sang just now is real through and through. Happy Easter. God bless you. Go in peace, but make sure you go. And I don't mean just go away. <laughs> go. Amen. Amen.